Glory to God. We give God all the praise. As you're joining in, you can share this broadcast. This is going to be amazing what we're dealing with on here. But once you find your river with God, nobody can stop you. Nothing in this life can stop you. You should strive every moment of your life to stay in that river that is designated for you. Um, the presence of God will work with your faith so that you could have results. I'm going to be dealing with something on here that's going to be so powerful. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 28 says this. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with, your, with, with you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now, we have heard about the grace being in you. We've heard about the grace being upon you. But look what the Bible says here. It says that his grace be with you. Now, with the grace of God being with you, this is different than grace inside of you. When something is with you, that means that it's there, but you have to actively take it, use it, apply it. But it's going to be there. When grace is with you, is the same way like you having a purse with you. If you go inside the store and you don't take the purse, you can't make an exchange. Because inside of that purse, you got money, you got cards, you got all that different type of stuff. So imagine the grace of the Lord being with you. The grace is with you. But as a result, it will only be with you until you engage it. So what's an example of this? If we remember in the word of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus was with the disciples, but only Peter was able to answer King Jesus's question, but the grace of the Lord was with them. So anybody could have answered it because the Lord asked all of them. So everybody could have answered the question. But you notice that Peter is the only one that steps with the grace. Everybody else had grace, but only him flowed with the grace. So well, I want you to see is that when we're dealing with the grace, the grace is potential. God plants himself around you hoping that you'll engage and remember he's a spirit. So remember his grace don't just come without him. He there, that's his grace, that's his ability, but he hides that ability for you to seek it out. So when, when every, every day that you wake up, you have grace reserved for supernatural thoughts, but that doesn't mean that your thoughts are going to be supernatural. Because that grace of the Lord Jesus is with you. But it doesn't mean that it's going to be operating for you. But it's with you for you to make a choice for it to operate for you. But if you don't make the choice, then that grace just going to be with you. So when, 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 the, when the Lord was on the water, all the disciples saw him on the water. The grace to walk on the water was available to all of them. But remember, the grace is only, it, it, it's only took by Peter again. And you see in the Bible, Peter keeps on taking the grace. The other 11 not taking the grace. They just watching. But whatever you see, you have the power to demonstrate. That's why God lets you see it. See, your soul, your soul is moved by what you see. So the same way the devil sends stuff 
for you to see it. Your soul is moved by what you see. For you to sin against God the same way, God sends stuff so that you can become more spirit in your functionality, more spirit in your thoughts, more spirit in your decisions. Both kingdoms sends literature in a curriculum and pictures so that your soul could have desires from the kingdom. So Satan doesn't always, uh, is not the only one sending pictures. Remember, Satan got that from God. God sends pictures so that you could desire righteousness. So Elisha needs to go to the next level, but Elisha is showing him and is cultivating a greater desire in Elisha because he's looking at Elijah. Timothy is looking at Apostle Paul and is cultivating in him to proceed with the father. Joshua is watching Moses, is cultivating him to proceed with the father. Lot is watching Abraham, is to train him how to proceed with the father. Are you seeing this? So all throughout your life, you have the demons at work to give you what you're not supposed to see so that you sin against God. And then the angels of the Lord are there to show you what you need to see so that you would become more submissive, more surrendered, more of a vehicle for God to drive you wherever he want to drive you. Here's where you come in. Every single moment of your life, you have to choose what you're going to entertain what you're going to let inside of your soul, what you're going to move upon. Do you know why the God path, a lot of people will never find it. You know why there is a straight and narrow path. Only a few that be that finds it because the straight and narrow path requires you to become numb to what you feel, but it produces a feeling in the end. Satan gives you the feeling first, but then it produces nothing in the end. God gives you nothing at first and it produces a feeling in the end. Now, sometimes the Lord waves that. He lets you feel a lot of stuff because you're a babe. But really the, the straight and narrow path, when you start walking with God, for real, for real, not baby stage, he removes that feel good stuff and, 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 and it's like nothing in the beginning but then you start feeling results in the end. When you walk in with Satan, Satan give you the feeling in the beginning, but then there's nothing in the end. That's how God um, starts dealing with you when you get mature. First, it's nothing, then you start seeing the feel good the results, the pleasure, the satisfaction, the demonstration, the evidence, the testimony, the witness, the progress, the prosperity, the health. And then that's what you receive over time. But Satan gives you the feel good at the beginning that over time you see how destroyed you are. Let's go here again. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 28. Look what it says. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your, be with you. Be with you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. If that grace be with you, then there are words in that grace that you're supposed to be speaking. There's words in that grace that you're supposed to prophesy. That grace being with you has statements that's supposed to come out of your mouth that have creation power in it. That when you speak it, it's going to create things. Then the grace being with you also have a thought system that you're supposed to think. Have thoughts that you're supposed to have inside of you. Now, you could think bad thoughts and this grace is right there for you to think all the right thoughts. See, the grace is with you. 
Are you seeing this? The grace is with you, but you have to engage that grace that's with you for your thoughts to be right. So how do we engage the grace? When we deal with the mind, you engage the grace for your mind by what you're learning, what you're studying, what you're letting be spoken to you. Because remember, the grace for your mind is really the information, the knowledge you're receiving. So if you're going to have the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ for your mind, then you have to use the, the anointing of discretion where you start filtering what you watch, filtering what you listen to, filtering who you converse with. If you're going to have the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ operating in your mind, see the grace always going to be with you. You see what I'm saying? But if you're going to get it engaged, to your mind, then you flow in, in, in um, discretion. And discretion is the wisdom of what, uh, of what to allow inside of you. Discretion is becoming smarter on what you see. Like when Peter looked at the winds blowing, that was the end of his discretion. But when he looked at King Jesus, that was his discretion. So watch, now he's doing something with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that's with him. Are you seeing that? Now you're operating with the grace that's with you. But you gotta use discretion as long as he's using that law of discretion, which is a spiritual weapon, we got so much spiritual weapons that for you to be a complete woman and a complete man, a wholesome person, you have to use all of your weapons. That's why I said the weapon of your warfare, they are not carnal. When it says not carnal, it means that it's not naturalized. It's not built by flesh and blood. When it says that the weapons of your warfare are not carnal, that means that the, it proceeded from the father's belly. These are things that the father does. These are ways and traits that the father has. So the weapons of your warfare, when it says it's not carnal, it means that it didn't come from a human. It didn't come from the earth. It didn't come from demons. It didn't come from satanic angels, devils. It didn't come from Satan. These weapons came and proceeded out of the father's soul. So when you're moving in these weapons of your warfare that are not carnal, but they are mighty in God. Notice it's mighty in God. Whether we say through God, mighty through God or mighty in God. Remember, through still means that it's passing through the inward. So even if we say, oh, oh well, well, it's mighty through God, not mighty in God. But still, think about it. For you to go through a tunnel, you're in the tunnel. Think about that. If you go through Canada... That means that you're in Canada while you're traveling. You didn't stay there, but it, you went through. That means that you entered in as well. So when, when we hear about the weapons of your warfare, they are mighty in God. They came from the insides of God. So when you use them, the same power that God is, the Lord God, the Lord Jesus himself, that same power is now being translated to you as a woman, as a man. So what you think going to start happening? That's Christ in you, the hope of glory now, Colossians. To the pulling down of strongholds. Where did the strongholds come from? Demons. The natural realm. The earth realm. It's pulling down all the things that you learned from this natural life. 
that gave demons leverage to rule you. So the evil spirits that have power over you based upon what you have learned in this life, what you have seen. Because remember, 1 John says, all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh. That means that your body craves things. The lust of the eye, that means that this desire came from your sight, what you watched. And the pride of life, that means that even when you're in disobedience to God, you, you find a way to celebrate it. Make it look normal. Make it look okay. So when it says the weapons of your warfare are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, the pride of life, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye are all full of strongholds. That means that demons hold you strong because they use what you feel in your body to create an appetite. They use what you see with your eyes to create a desire and they use the pride of life to create slavery because as long as the pride of life is operating then you become a slave to the era the era of staying in depression you notice that people that's in depression they stay in depression because the pride of life you never heard it like that probably before but if somebody stays in depression it's because of the pride of life you know what because depression, if it continues, now that person is, is, is um, they're worshiping the demon of depression. And now that stronghold, it is being magnified of, above the power of God, the plan of God. The same way if somebody stays in strife or if you stay in fear or if you stay in prayerlessness. Do you know that prayerlessness is a stronghold? If you go your whole day, your whole week, and you ain't mele besoro lovo, rande besondo lovo, rapa soto lovo, rebe sede de ve, reste televosu, sidi vidi levako. If you ain't say, Lord, I praise you in 24 hours, that's a stronghold operating. If somebody wrongs you, and you don't call their name and say, I forgive so-and-so. You got to do that because you don't really know who you forgive. You don't know who you forgive until the moment of pressure comes. And now you can cuss somebody out. You don't know who you forgive. So you got to see. Children of God has to stop waiting until uh, for the storm to come for them to say, peace, be still. They have to say, peace be still when there's no storm. Children of God need to stop waiting to cast out devils when they see slob coming out somebody's mouth. You cast out devils when you realize that something is breaking the atmosphere of your productivity, your hunger. Your submission, your willingness, cooperate, even cooperation is a Holy Spirit ability. Sometimes people have acted like they was filled with the spirit, but they're not easy to cooperate with. The Holy Ghost make you easy to cooperate with. So when your boss tell you something, you don't say, well, uh, uh, well, uh. No, the Holy Ghost actually empowers you to cooperate with your paycheck is. Cooperation is a grace of the spirit. See, the grace of the Lord Jesus is always with you. But if you don't engage it, then you are struggling in an area where the grace actually came to supply you with victory and a testimony. What is really a testimony? It's your ability to disrespect temptation. A testimony is your ability to disrespect temptation.
A testimony is you spitting on the devil's options. Consistently. Because remember, for it to be a testimony, that means that there was a whole bunch of tests that came. Saints, do you know when God is testing you? The enemy will allow you to feel to go against what you should do. Wisdom. So in every test, there's a temptation from Satan somewhere. And in every temptation, there's a test from God somewhere. Now, Satan does not control God's test. And God does not control Satan's temptation. Remember, God does not tempt you with evil. So if you go your whole day and you feel like arguing with somebody, you feel like cussing somebody out, that's not God pitting that on you. It's the devil. But you have to still observe and understand God's still watching to see whether I'm going to cast down this imagination. I can choose not to cast down the imagination. Now, I'm failing twofold. I failed with the temptation, but I'm actually failing a test. I could feel the temptation, but it's still a test because God in the back seeing if you're going to let that thought linger or you're going to take control of your mind. Every 24 hours of your life, you're not going to have complete continual conversation with God without any type of attempt from Satan to interrupt it. So if you are leaning on just the voice of God to hold you, hold you, hold you, there's going to be some times where God is not going to magnify his voice to see if you're going to pursue it. Remember when Elijah was running from Jezebel and said that God spoke in a still small voice. So that means until he became still and he became small, he wasn't going to hear the voice. The voice was in the third bracket. So he had to become still. That means that you're not hopping into the options, the pictures, the, the suggestions of the enemy. And then he had to become small. That's leaving arrogance. That's leaving pride. And then he discovered the voice. So imagine if he holds on to his, 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 his pride, arrogance. Imagine if you hold on to everything. Guess what? Now, you're not going to be able to operate in what we call, okay, now, the voice. Because the voice is hidden after the fact. The voice not in the beginning. So think about this. You might go to sleep and wake up and think that like you're going to hear the voice of God. But you don't know that yesterday you probably went to sleep with something that was proud. Meaning somebody probably had you talk about somebody or hurt somebody and you never even thought of it that it was wrong. But you went to sleep in that state. So now you got pride there. Because you're not small. You don't see pride is when you become a Goliath. To what God wants. Remember, Goliath was blocking the people of God from what God wanted. So pride is where you become a Goliath. So imagine if you're not small. That means that you have become a Goliath, which means you, you operate like a Philistine, like an enemy. Like a son of God. Remember the sons of God went inside the daughters of men. They had giants. So you, you operating with satanic seed. Satanic angel seed. So the voice of God can't get to you in that state. Now if you become small. 
and you become still, that means you stop moving all over the place. You stop listening to everything. You stop being accessible with wrong information, ungodly counsel. You use discretion. How do you become still? You use discretion. How do you become small? You humble yourself. And then there's the voice of God. Are you seeing this? If you become still and you become small, the voice of God is now the river that you're rewarded with. That third vein of river, which is the voice of God, is where all your victory is. That's where your wisdom is. Remember, Proverbs chapter two, verse seven says that he stores up sound wisdom. He stores it up. That means that even though you belong to God, he hiding something from you that you're really supposed to know. Now, if you think about that, that's real scary. Because how much wisdom is God hiding from you and you don't seek him out on? And so your decisions are enslaved to the absence of that wisdom. If God is giving, if God reserves the wisdom for your health, you will make decisions that make you sick in the future because your health in the future was hidden in that wisdom that God hid away. That's why seeking God is so powerful. How do you really seek God? The same way you seek Google. <laughs> the same way you seek people's business. It requires focus. It requires energy. It requires continuance. How do you seek God? The same way you seek your child that's in a store and you can't find which aisle they're in. You stop everything that you could be pursuing and you find out what is the will of the Lord. You seek the Lord the same way you seek if you lose your ID. That's your only ID. Seeking the Lord is simply stopping the appetite that you currently have to discover the appetite that God wants you to have. Man, that's good, boy. That's good, boy. I'm going to take, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. You ain't got to take this word for you. Did you catch what I just said there? Seeking God. You betraying the appetite that you currently have to discover the appetite that God wants you to have. So when you seek in God, it, 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 is, it is more so you're applying to become a student at his feet. You're crying out to be taught. You're crying out to be instructed. You're crying out to be mentored, discipled, informed, counseled. Remember King Jesus is the wonderful counselor. Remember people go to counselors to find out how to stop drinking, how to stop smoking, how to stop lying, how to stop um, doing things that are destructive, right? Well, King Jesus is the wonderful counselor. So think about it in this sense. King Jesus has a department where he shows you here a little and there a little how to escape what you're enslaved to. King Jesus has a department in the glory that effectively guides you out of iniquity. That department in the glory of God is specifically to show you lessons of how to be wiser.
with him being the wonderful counselor. So also this, him being the wonderful counselor, it also means that when he's counseling you, the results of the counseling is you're going to become a wonder. People are going to wonder how you was that way and now you're this way. People are going to wonder how could they do what you did to have the maturity that you have, the wisdom that you have, the fruits that you have, the provision that you have, the health, the wealth that you have. They're going to want to know. That's the powerful thing about the Lord Jesus counseling you. Many people don't see the Holy Ghost as a counselor. But the Holy Spirit will counsel you of how to obtain something that is rightfully yours every single day. Remember the Bible says that he daily loads you with benefits. Here we go with the grace of the Lord Jesus being with you. Every day you're loaded with benefits. So why every day you don't have a load of benefits? You got to engage the grace. When you engage the grace of the Lord Jesus, now what was already scheduled, now you start seeing the visibility of it. So, how did Mary Magdalene get free from seven devils? Number one, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ was with her. But how does she actually get free? She's engaging that grace. How does Nicodemus step out of the ignorance of not knowing what it means to be born again? How does he step out of the ignorance of not knowing what it means to be saved? How does he step out of the ignorance of not knowing what it means to be a real teacher of the word, a real teacher of the law, a real one, an anointed one? Nicodemus came to King Jesus by night. Which is so significant because the reason why he didn't really know King Jesus fully was because he was living in the night. See, whatever area is blocking you from Jesus, you're going to have to confront it with Jesus. Glory to God. See, Nicodemus was living out of the night realm, darkness, blindness, iniquity, rebellion, disobedience, deception. So he comes to King Jesus. In the same area in which he'd been a slave. And when he confronts the darkness with the light himself, Jesus himself, he comes out with light. Remember, did not King Jesus explain to him what it means to be born again? An explanation from Jesus is a revelation for you. And that's what light is all about. Light causes you to see. Light causes you to understand. Do you know that you, 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 when you turn on your lights in a room, you see where the remote control is, you understand where it is as well. Because seeing has a affiliation with understanding. If you see, when you open up the refrigerator, the light is in the refrigerator, you see where the orange juice is you also understand what the orange juice is. So, with King Jesus saying that he's the light of the world, it was good for Nicodemus to come to him while he's in darkness and he comes to him in the time where it is dark outside because now he's eradicating that realm and letting the light come in. How much more God pitch you in predicaments like Nicodemus? He lets you see darkness, 
But now it's an opportunity for you to receive light. It's a time in your life where you can receive light. There are some days you wake up, the spirit will willfully let you be in darkness. Because it's time for you to seek out light. Do you know that sometimes you could be doing everything right and God will still let you wake up in the darkness? Because in that day, it's a day to seek the Lord. It's a day to discover the light afresh. Remember David? David dealt with the fresh anointing. Samuel was a carrier of the fresh anointing. Remember? He anointed, uh, he anointed uh, uh, Saul, then he anointed David. We see the fresh anointing moving. King Jesus prayed for the blind man. He gave them a fresh anointing. Then he prayed for the 10 lepers. He gave them a fresh anointing. There was only one leper that came back and engaged the fresh anointing. The other nine took that fresh anointing and let it die off. So really, how do you keep your anointing fresh? You got to stay in engagement mode with King Jesus. You got to talk with him. You got to praise him. Do you know that praise is the highest way to respond to King Jesus? That's the highest. Worship. Praise and worship is the highest way that you can respond to King Jesus. It's the highest level of expression uh, um, expression and verbal, uh, verbal dealings with him. That's the highest way. That's why I said, get enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Now, saints, when we deal with the gates, the gates is everything that's going to happen to you that God wants to happen to you in this life. Those gates are deciding what happens to you in alignment with the will of God. Remember, on this rock, I build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell have events that happen to you in this life. How much more the gates of God? So the gates of God, when you're living out of those gates, when you activate those gates, everything that you want to happen, all of the goodness of God, the blessing of God, those, those events are in those gates. So think about this. The Bible said, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. So when you're thanking God, you're inviting the activities which he has planned for you in heaven. And that's why Thessalonians chapter, first uh, Thessalonians chapter five, verse 18 says, um, give thanks in all things for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. So then we say praise, enter into his courts with praise. Now we're dealing with God giving you justice. When you're praising God, you're suing the devil. When you're celebrating God, you are winning cases in the spirit. So imagine when you start responding to the Lord with thanksgiving and praise, you're not only opening up the gates for your life to receive what heaven has scheduled, but now you're, you're receiving justice. You're receiving God judging your life wherever things have been happening that Satan wanted to happen against you. Now you're releasing God to bring order and correction to it. So, so the praising aspect is you now inviting the Lord to perfect those things that concern you. Saints, I hope that you get in this, huh? This is real powerful what I'm telling you. I hope that you get in this. I really hope that you get in this because you don't want to lose the battle in life. You don't want to lose the battle in this life and you don't, you, you don't want to have the grace of our Lord Jesus being with you. Look, look, first Thessalonians chapter five, verse 28, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So his grace is there. The grace, we dealt with the grace for the mind. Let's talk about the grace for the body real quick. 
You don't have to suffer sickness forever. I was thinking about that today. You know, I had chronic asthma. I couldn't breathe. I was very sick when I was a little boy. I remember I couldn't smell certain uh, cleaning objects. You know, like if somebody is using like cleaning objects for like dish and sink and um, you know how people just spray random stuff like in the air, like, you know, for cleaning. I would have reactions in my body. I was very, very, very sick. Sick unto death. As I got older, of course, it kind of weans off. But I was still very sick, very, very sick. And um, the Lord healed my body completely of that. Now I could smell, I could smell stuff, cleaning the objects. I could smell all those things. They don't bother me. But before that, I would get very sick. My lung was, my lungs was horrible in the state of uh, handling those things. So I was very sick. Now I'm completely healed, completely. I was thinking about that today, how it's the power of the Lord that went through my body and took the brokenness of my lungs and made my lungs completely whole. That's the grace of the Lord Jesus was with me, but I started engaging the presence of the Lord, the healing presence of the Lord. And I had determined in my mind that I didn't, I didn't care about how long it would take. I knew I was going to receive the manifestation of health by all means. And it happened that the Lord touched my body and he healed me. Then he gave me grace to release healing to those that I minister to on earth. But one thing that I realize is this, the grace for healing is present, but people can still choose to be sick and they can still choose to be um, enslaved to the body if they don't make right decisions of how to engage that grace. Like, let me give you some examples. Sometimes people, the grace of the Lord Jesus is with them to heal them. And they're trying to pursue a relationship with a woman. It could be a man, right? They're trying to pursue a relationship with a woman. But what they don't understand is that's adversarial to that grace right now. Because even the bodily formation right there, God want them to seek him. It's like, it's not a time to be, you know, it's a time to seek him, right? But if that man is too involved in other stuff, even though that grace is there to heal him, he is not allowing that grace to do its work, but it's with him. And so he gets sick, he gets sick, he gets sick. The decisions is blocking the grace that's with them to be here. Are you seeing this? Healing can be blocked. It can be blocked through unforgiveness. It could be blocked through um, not guarding your eye gates and your ear gates. If you're being fed a lot of stuff, and that don't have nothing to do with your healing. It don't have nothing to do with the gospel. The stuff is blocking. See, when I got healed, I wasn't watching no TV. I wasn't watching none of that stuff. Like I was, I was in another world. To this day, I'm still learning how to operate according to this world. You know, like this world requires certain things. I'm learning how to operate according to this world. Because I'm really like a heavenly minded being. <laughs> the disciples was like that in the gospels. Remember, they said, let Stephen, let us appoint some people to deal with the business while we just preach the word word because they was consumed with heavenly mindedness. It's not bad. 
but a preacher has been sent to the earth to release something that's not of the earth. A prophet had been sent to the earth to release something that's not from the earth. And so you, you will tend to be more heavenly minded and, and function in the heavenly realm rather than the earth realm. The grace of our Lord Jesus being with you. The grace of the Lord Jesus is always around you. When you start saying, Lord, I thank you, I praise you. Now you're engaging that grace. When you say, Lord, I forgive so-and-so. Now you're engaging that grace. When you study the word, now you're engaging that grace. When you start decreeing a thing, now you're engaging that grace. When you le brusta tama rebe sete, raba sondo lo vose, sere vedele vo corandi, zi brusta ta, randi veso. You praying in tongues, you engage in the grace. You don't have to wait to pray in no tongues. You can pray in the tongue right now. Pray in tongues. That's a, that's a spiritual right. You don't have to wait. God not going to make you pray in tongues. You know that, right? God not going to make you pray in tongues. You pray in tongues off of your will. That's why Apostle Paul said, I wish that you prayed in tongues as much as I do. I wish. Well, he's saying y'all missing that the grace is with you. The grace right there with you, you got to use it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, uh, let's go here. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 19 says, quench not the spirit. Quench not the spirit. That means that the Holy Spirit going to guide you mentally in wanting to do certain things and you have to be led by him. You can't fight him and resist him and put another schedule above that. This is so glorious because when it says quench not the spirit, that means that the spirit going to introduce to you. Okay, I want you to do this right now. I want you to praise me right now. I want you to study the word right now. Uh, in some cases, I want you to fast right now. You know, the spirit. Because you, 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 you live by yourself, right? You might live with somebody. You live by yourself. You may not got no profit in side of your house. You may not got somebody that's an apostle. The spirit will guide you and talk to you about your, your momentary decisions. The Holy Spirit will tell you, okay, I want you to forgive people right now that you've been holding in your heart. Okay, I want you to decrease something right now into your atmosphere. You'll feel the spirit leading you to do something. I want to also say this to you and always remember this. A lot of times, when you set out to do something, what you call spiritual, right? You can feel a pushback on it. You can feel like the atmosphere is heavy. Sometimes you're using the wrong weapon for that time. Even though it's a weapon from God, you can use the weapon at the wrong time and it can be ineffective. And the Holy Spirit will let you sense to break off from it. That's why if you minister and you can know what to switch off from ministering to, because the spirit will quicken you, let you know, nah, we're not talking about that. Sometimes it's not a time for you to say, Maybe it's not a time for that. Are you seeing this? These are just the deeper depths of being led by the spirit. Because God may be in conversation mode right there and then. So it's not time for you to go into all of that. Something that I have discovered is that the father, he's never too busy for praise. It never messes him up. He's never too busy for praise. He's never too busy for honor. It never messes him up. 
He loves that. He feeds on that. Remember, you was created to worship God. So he feeds off of that. When you want to pit him first in your money, he feeds off of that. When you want to pit him first with your gratitude, he feeds off of that. When you want to acknowledge the Lord in all your ways so that he could direct your path, he feeds off of that. You never violate it. Quench not the spirit. Quench not the spirit. That means that the spirit going to give you pictures in your mind of what you should do. Somebody going to be arguing with you in public that you never met before. You're going to want to say something real wild to them. And the spirit going to pit a fear and trembling on you. Don't say nothing. And, and either you can break what the spirit is doing and start talking. Ah, what you think, man? You can break it or you can stay and quench not the spirit. Glory to God. Quench not the spirit. And then look what verse 20 say. Despise not prophesying. That means don't hate God correcting you, directing you. Because what prophesying is all, all about really is like giving you direction, giving you insight about what's to come. Giving you insight about something that you can't see. Sometimes it's your character. Sometimes it's your mindset. Sometimes it's your attitude. See, prophesying is not just, okay, God going to give you this. That's a part of prophesying. But prophesying is the Lord showing you something that you, you most likely couldn't see. You, you couldn't evaluate. You couldn't view it. You couldn't discern it, perceive it. You probably couldn't receive it. But now it's the prophesying. Now God is making a time available for you to hear it. It's being spoken to you. And, and saints, remember Nathan found out that from, uh, 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 David found that out from Nathan. Remember the prophesying was to reveal to him that he mishandled Bathsheba's husband like he shouldn't have killed him. Like he shouldn't have put him in the front of the battle and got him murdered. You see what I'm saying? So the prophesying of Nathan was just to show David uh, something that he, he, he handled wrongly. So when we say despise not prophesying, it's also saying despise not correction. Don't despise being perfected, going through a process. Don't despise God showing you what's not right, what needs to be right, what needs to be tweaked, what needs to be fixed. Don't despise that. Look at verse 21. It says, prove all things. First Thessalonians 5, 21. Prove all things. You, how could you prove all things? Do you know what it means to prove? That means that you have to seek the Lord to find out clarity here. So this is a labor in the spirit. Prove all things. Pray in the Holy Ghost over it. Praise God over it. Thank him over it. Um, verbally tell the Lord, I receive your wisdom concerning my life. I receive your good understanding. I receive it right now. Confront it and allow there to be clarity. And look what it says there. Hold fast that which is good. Because after you prove all things, you done sought the Lord. Now the Lord is going to reveal to you what is good. And now is telling you to hold fast that which is good. Are you seeing this? It's saying now take what God has showed you after you done sought him. And he done revealed to you what his righteousness is, what he likes here. Now you hold that fast. Why do you hold it fast? Because Satan will steal it from you. Glory to God. 